So good, good morning, Peter. It's a pleasure to, to have you here on board our podcast for uh, the computer science department of Pukihiyu. And this is a series about gaming and how to, to foster the DS ecosystem in Brazil. And you are experts in this, seeing new ecosystem blossom everywhere. And we'll go through, through that a, a little bit. But you have an awesome career, right? Pro, uh, before Griffin, uh, Lionsgate, founder of Nerdist Industries, even also a professor at a university about esports. So that's a, a perfect setting for, for this conversation. Uh, also an early investor at Rovio, Angry Birds, uh, which is a huge global success. So it's nice to, to, for people to know a little bit more uh, about you. Well, thank you for having me. Um, uh, it it uh, means a lot to participate and uh, um, you know, to hopefully be um, at, the, at the forefront and one of the building blocks of, of building a, a more substantive bridge between our markets with respect to gaming, um, but yes, I've I've been in and around interactive software my entire career. First investment I ever made uh, back in 1998 was a company called GameSpy Industries, which we ended up selling to IGN and then and then News Corp. And it was a software crawler that allowed for one to play against others all over the globe um, prior to that technology existing at scale. So. Um, got the bug very early on uh, with respect to placing bets and deploying capital uh, within the gaming uh, ecosystem. Brilliant, brilliant. And, and uh, how it led for you to, uh, to, to Griffin before you were an executive, a founder, and then how this all converged to say, I want to invest and I, uh, I want to be on, on another side of the table. But very you know, active, I, I would, also I know. Well, you know, I'm 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 one of those um, one of those folks who I'm a serial entrepreneur and I have been my entire career. Um, but I very cliche started in the mailroom at a talent agency. Um, you know, worked my way up the food chain. Um, never was an agent, but um, ended up working for the chairman and the founder of of the agency. Um, but understood early on what it meant to learn the grind. And kind of the inner workings um, of how the the entertainment industry worked. Um, my role just prior to standing up Griffin was doing something entrepreneurial within a corporate environment, which was also very enticing to me. Um, Lionsgate at the time didn't have a gaming division. Uh, I I knew the CEO and the chairman quite well, and I was attracted to the idea of doing something entrepreneurial um and at the you know when you think about gaming with respect to traditional media platforms gaming's now larger than film publishing and music combined so when you see an entertainment industry uh or entertainment company rather at scale um that's lacking uh that vertical that's an exciting endeavor so it, it took four years to to do that at lionsgate just prior to that I was the co-founder and CEO of Nerdist Industries, which we scaled um, over five years and sold that to Legendary Entertainment, which was a lot of fun. Nice to put a, a run on, on the board. Um, and it was um, just prior to that where um, I had gotten involved with Rovio very, very early on. I've been to Finland 53 times. I hope at some point I'll be able to say I've been to Brazil 54 times. Um, we'll, we'll make sure this happens. I'm I'm keen on it. Um, I I enjoyed my time there so much. So we'll we'll touch on that in a moment. But um, spending as much time as I did in in Northern Europe, in particular in Finland, um, I was able to um, get involved with Rovio very early on. I helped them put their global licensing and merchandise program together uh, with and for them at that time. Um, and then you know pr prior to that, I'd done. A lot of underwriting from my personal balance sheet, um, ran a small uh, pledge fund. I did a stint at the Walt Disney Company, which was amazing early on in, in my career um, to understand the power of a brand, you know, in particular as gaming and interactive software and particularly the Internet 
uh, was just taking off. So um, working at a platform like that, first from kind of the corporate development side of the house, um, and then um, helping to be, you know, early on in the standing up of their interactive software group, just a, a very uh, poignant moment in time to be able to leverage, you know, one of the world's largest intellectual property brands to, to get a kind of your MBA, if you will, uh, in, in where the industry was going. Amazing, amazing, and you also have contact to to to, to the uh, the new generation, right? You are a professor at US, USC around competitive gaming, esports. Uh, how is that? How how do you see that involvement? Uh, how does it make you feel fresh and always on? Uh, also teaching, but listening to this new generation. Yeah, the first lesson I learned was they, they would they refused to communicate with me via any other platform other than Discord. Um, so I learned very early on the emails I was sending to my my students were being ignored, um, and that the only way they would communicate with me was through Discord. And I think to your point, um, dealing with students is a constant reminder that the emperor has no clothes. Um, you know, they're very direct. Um, they don't necessarily have political filters through which um, they're monitoring their content. Um, their questions come from a very genuine place of orientation. Oftentimes, if they're considering a career in that field, they're asking a question that has a lot behind it. Um, I also enjoy their their appetite um, for for learning. And I, and I did figure out over time, at least with respect to how I taught, that having, um, covering a subject, whatever that subject may be, um, and teaching to it, but then having someone come in who actually is a practical application of that part of the industry, whose career is in that subsector of the industry was very, very helpful. So, you know, you had the curriculum and then you had the practical application in the real world. And I found that combination to be very poignant. It really did hit home with the kids. And it did lead me to some of the conversations you and I have had around um, helping to build out the university ecosystem around gaming and, and empowering these kids, these students to learn <clears throat> facets of the industry that perhaps they wouldn't be able to stumble upon by themselves. Um, and whether that's remote learning, you know, at university, I think there's so many ways to betress these the existing programs and and create collaborations between University of Southern California, you know, where I've been able to co-teach over the years. Um, and I think they have the most robust interactive software program in the world. Uh, but they're always keen to collaborate with with others. Um, and it's a it's a thriving, robust community. And you mentioned uh, Discord. So you are an in investor in uh not only in game studios like Scopely, uh, very successful, uh, different types of game content like Winzo in India and also Discord and infrastructure plays in gaming. How, how do you see from an investor standing point where uh, the, the most interesting new opportunities to, to inspire uh, students at the computer science department, the science department, at several different departments at universities related to, to the gaming industry. And as you said, it's now much bigger than other forms of entertainment. Yes. So early on, I, I like I mentioned, uh, I was an investor in GameSpy, for example. My partner, uh, Phil Sanderson, was the first, um, first institutional capital into Discord at an $8 million valuation. And they just raised somewhere between at a 13 to 15 billion dollar valuation. Um, so the this this notion of investing in platform and infrastructure alongside content has always been of great interest to me and quite frankly, my firm. Um, it's one of our core mandates is to make sure that we remain tapped into that infrastructure side of, of the business because it there's a lot of data to be gleaned um, from these platforms. They truly do understand consumption patterns um, on a macro scale. Um, and that can help inform um, what you're doing on the content side, certainly from an investment orientation, but even as a developer, 
if you have access to that information and you understand um, a bit more about where the audience, um, what they're responding positively to, and perhaps what they're gravitating away from, you know, that can help as you're putting together your product roadmap. Amazing. And, and, and Peter, uh, you were talking about Winzo, which is in India, and, and you saw several ecosystems around gaming uh, blossom. And you were recently at Saudi Arabia in the next World Forum. Forum, and you advocated a proactive approach to understanding the ecosystem from university teams and students to thriving platforms. Uh, the same applies to, to Brazil. And I believe we are under indexed in this uh, because we have lots of players, but at the same time, we have fewer uh, successful gaming studios, infrastructure companies than places, as you said, like Finland where uh, and the Nordics. Uh, could you please unpack this uh, proactive approach applying to Brazil? What could be the role of PUC Rio and the, the other universities about this in us, our the, the local VCs? Sure. And I, 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 I did just get back from Saudi Arabia, uh, you know, right before you and I got together. Um, and I think similarly to when I, I went down and spoke at the, um, the Brazil indie game show down in Sao Paulo, um, there is a palpable excitement around gaming in markets like Brazil and Saudi. Um, and the, the demographics, uh, as well as the consumption patterns are just, you can't ignore them. They're off the charts. And so Saudi has been very proactive as a government. Um, they're, they're very um, aggressive with respect to subsidies. They make it very attractive to companies to either start up in market or even um, co-locate, if you will, you know, within the kingdom. Um, they do a lot of programming around gaming, in particular competitive gaming, which is also a huge deal in Brazil. Brazil loves their competitive gaming. Um, you know, if you just, uh, if, if you look at the history of the markets that have dominated in consumption, Brazil's always atop that list. Um, in terms of the university role, it's something I speak a lot about. You and I have spoken about the, the earlier we can empower these kids and these students um, and give them optionality with respect to choosing a career within the industry. You mentioned computer science. Um, you know, I, I think also entrepreneurial programs, marketing, journalism, all of these areas as the industry matures, there's going to be so many sub facets, if you will, uh, within the industry where people could can pers pursue a career. So um, it behooves us, you know, as folks that um, are investing in the sector um, and yourself, you know, who's obviously involved at the university level, myself with my proximity to, to USC, always looking for ways to uh, create more opportunities for students to get versed in the industry so that they can start up locally because that's the key it, it can't be long term it can't be the strategy that you're going to import talent from other markets um, and hope that takes root and then they're employing um, locals um, to work on their platforms um, whilst that could be interesting there's a ceiling to that model um, what's way more compelling uh, when you look at a market like brazil when you have the numbers that you have, you have the consumption patterns that you have, the demographics that you have, um, the legacy, um, in particular in competitive gaming, um, matchmaking platforms, et cetera. Um, it, 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 it's in all of our best interest to make sure that the curriculum is robust as possible, that the kids feel like they can pursue a career locally. So not that they're just learning and getting smart and then going to pursue a career in Northern Europe or Western Europe, or the United States um, or elsewhere, much rather have a thriving ecosystem in your own backyard in Brazil. And I think of it, to me, it's analogous to restaurants. You know, I grew up in Los Angeles. I grew up in Santa Monica. I, you know, grew up watching Venice um, and the little area of Abbot Kinney become this mecca for quality food. It is, you know, one of the places that people go to for some of the best food in Los Angeles. That wasn't the case 30 years ago. 
And what happened is you had one or two restaurants like Jelena pop up and they were extraordinary and they were attracting a lot of people to that geography, that, that micro geography within Los Angeles. Well, then all of a sudden other restaurants start popping up. And then if you open a restaurant, if you were subpar, suboptimal offering, you were gone because the competition, the bar just became too high. And I, you know, I, I do look at that as an analogy for emerging markets um, where at university level, we can start to help prime that pump. And Finland, Finland was a confluence of a series of events, you know, that we haven't seen anywhere else in the industry. It's almost like Norway in the Winter Olympics. You know, you see a country of 7 million people taking most of the gold medals, right? You know, Finland is that in gaming. Uh, with respect to the amount of runs they've been able to put on the board, uh, points on the board, if you will, um, don't like using baseball analogies where baseball isn't that popular. Uh, but if you think about companies like um, Supercell, um, you know, Next Games, which just sold to Netflix, Seriously, which sold to Zynga, um, Rovio, obviously, um, recently selling to Sega. And, and there's many other remedy over the years. Um, you know, there was there was a few things that came together there. Nokia, you know, started in Finland and they were probably the first handset manufacturer to think of the phone as something other than, you know, just a thing to make phone calls with. If you remember the early game of Snake on the Series 40s and Series 60 phones, it was a fun game. But even then they were thinking there are more dynamic things we can do with this piece of hardware. And so that coupled to, there's a company actually whose board I served for five years called Sulake, uh, which was Habo Hotel, which was a virtual world for teenagers. And it was the first of its kind. And kind of they, along with Nexon, almost invented free to play, you could argue. And you had a lot of that DNA from Sulake coupled to Nokia executives that were leaving the company who started to teach at university. Um, and it led to this, um, you know, this confluence of events that has spawned a tremendous amount of talent in that very small market. Sorry, that was a bit of a long-winded answer. I, no, I, no, I, no. I, I, I'm unpacking this here in my brain. Uh, you mentioned this, uh, this, this aspect of gaming that's very multidisciplinary, right? So if they go... Uh, Let's create a game studio. It's not only about the, the developers, right? It's the design. Sound is also very important. Uh, lots of those are, are, are uh, multiplayer, how to create the communities around it, marketing, especially in, in uh, mobile games. Uh, doing marketing really well is also super important to, to see the, the light of day. But most times universities are silos, right? You have like the computer science department, the uh, uh, marketing, etc. How do you create this kind of multidisciplinary conversation? And from your experience in, in USC and other uh, academic institutions that you have been involved with? Well, first of all, you're so so right, and I I think you articulated better than than I did. Um, but the, the multidisciplinary aspects of, of running a successful game studio is, is a must because if you could have the best product out there, if you don't know how to reach your audience, you're dead on arrival. Um, and we see that happening all the time. If you don't understand the customer acquisition exercise, how to be efficient with that, how to understand the feedback and the data that you're getting, um, you know, seeing, seeing millions and millions of dollars get flushed down the drain with people not understanding both sides of, of that conversation. And I think with respect to the university, it's got to, it's got to start at the top. It's got to be a remit from on high that, Hey, we need to have collaboration between the entrepreneurship programs, the computer science programs and other parts of the university. Um, you know, if someone's pursuing a marketing degree, are there classes in gaming and interactive software that we can introduce I would, you know, getting guest professors, which, you know, I would love to work with you on. It's something that I've helped do now in markets all over the world. And it's really fun for the students, as you know, to get a new voice in the room, a new orientation towards their curriculum. Um, someone who's looking through the industry uh, through a lens that perhaps 
you know, they've never contemplated previously. Um, someone whose background and experience, um, they can speak to, you know, sure, they've had, like I prattled off some of the things I've done well over the years. I've had plenty of missteps. And you and I both know, you know, with our gray hair, um, that you learn a heck of a lot more from the mistakes, right, than the things you did right, because the mistakes don't feel good. So you don't want to repeat them. And I think that for students in particular who, um, while they've had life experiences, they haven't necessarily had them in the workforce. And I think that's, it's very important to have, you know, all of those voices. But it, the, the mandate, the remit's got to come from the top. You know, we, we have to have folks that understand um, that the kids need to be exposed to um, careers within the industry from a variety of different touch points. And I, I think, you know, what I have found, um, most universities um, appreciate the fact of, of mixing it up a little bit um, and having some new voices in the room. And then you can almost A-B test and see, oh, well, there's been a critical mass of students are really, really interested in this part of the industry. Why don't we focus on this first um, and maybe introduce a couple of classes that touch on, you know, these two subsectors within the industry and get that feedback and then build from that because USC was not an overnight success. You know, they've now been doing this for 25 years um, and they've kind of slowly built around it. Um, but they were able to, you know, spin off folks like, Brandon Beck and Mark Merrill, the founders of Riot. Um, you know, they were students at USC um, and they've been very generous back to the school. I think similar to what they've been able to do with their film program there, they just put these foundational blocks in place. Um, they get big names and voices, you know, from the industry to participate. Um, and then they, you know, kind of somewhat parking your ego at the door and really understanding um, what the students want. Um, what are they most interested in at this time? And that feels like a good place to start. And then you can build from there. And, and you mentioned uh, getting feedback when you're building and, and, and doing this. And when, when I talk to some sometimes to people that are very energetic about, it, I want to build a game, et cetera. But when I see later, uh, what actually helped to the to the game to the game student and I think you you got a little bit of a glimpse at that some amazing studios with great ideas at the 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 indie conference here in Brazil on this on, on how to start people overthink instead of let's do something but I, I think some of the struggles are around what should I do and when should I launch is I Oh, it will take a lot of time for me to do this so the game is complete and I'll launch when the game is totally complete and the idea that is only in my head is absolutely perfect. And at the same time, I see examples and I love the examples of Hades, which is on Steam, an indie, uh, an indie game uh, that they talked a lot to the community. Like They, they launched an, an alpha People mention, uh, people comment and say, I, I like this, I don't like this. And then they, they build upon the uh, the feedback from the community. There are lots and lots of examples of games being launched in alpha state, then beta state, and the community around games is very active and help them uh, to, to craft the final version that will then might be uh, full marketing uh, behind it for, for launch. H how do you see this approach that's let's talk a lot to communities and show this for console games and for mobile games. So people that are thinking about, uh, I'll start doing this, not get too anxious that, oh, I need to go from start to finish with a brilliant idea, very polished product uh, that will take perhaps three years for a small team. <clears throat> yeah, th there's, you know, first of all, my, my time at the, the Brazil Indie Game Show, I think me and Ibrahim, who I brought down from my team, took 70 plus meetings. Um, we were just blown away by the enthusiasm to have us down there. Everybody was very gracious as hosts. Everyone wanted to meet um, and everyone had such a positive orientation towards the industry. It was it was really palpable, the energy. Um, so I can't wait to get back down there um, and follow up on, on a ton of those meetings. Um, you know, I, I, 
I think you're right. The, the indie game space, if you will, has always been very supportive of um, the journey that you described, which is we're going to scr- scrounge up just enough capital to put forth, you know, this alpha version or, you know, alpha beta version of uh, our product. Um, and we're going to be very transparent with the consuming constituency that we want their feedback and we're going to build the remainder of this product with that feedback. Um, that happens a lot in indie gaming. You know, the problem with indie gaming, you know, quite frankly, at the end of the day is the economics aren't necessarily compelling enough to attract a ton of people to that side of, of the industry. They have, they have massive followings and at times massive niche followings, you know, sounds like a contradiction of terms, but it's not. Uh, these are people that are super passionate about these games. And then it's almost like discovering a band very early in the career of that band, right? Oh, I was, I was one of the first people, you know, to see Bruce Springsteen, you know, play in the, you know, back alleys in New Jersey, and then he became Bruce Springsteen. There's a lot of those stories in gaming as well. Oh, I found Raft, you know, before anyone else, or Hades before anyone else. I've been playing that game, you know, since XYZ date. And um, I think that's, there's a lot of fun in discovery. There's so much content offering on platforms such as Steam, um, where, you know, you can, um, you can, you can go down a rabbit hole and have a lot of fun doing that. I do think in today's world, the stresses of, oh, I need to be a huge, massively successful AAA game um, on console, um, or I need to be a breakout mobile title. Those days are, 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 are somewhat behind us. You know, cross-platforming is very much a thing now. Um, most studios that we underwrite have a cross-platform strategy. They know that they can reach um, the audience on the mobile platform, which is growing faster than, than any other. They know they can also reach them via console or PC, just depending on the type of offering. Oftentimes, there's a roadmap that would dictate which platform they will migrate to first and which they'll matriculate to over time. Um, it just depends on, on the nature of the product. But you do have more opportunities now, unlike in enterprise software, where you can get that feedback earlier on and you can dramatically pivot. You know, you can shelve an, a property like, oh, this is just not delivering the KPIs that we need to fund it going forward. And you can oftentimes do that without investing uh, an, an extraordinary amount of capital if you're efficient, but you also have to really read the data and, and park your ego at the door um, because you can't force of will these form factors, you know, um, to the consumer. They're going to enjoy what they're going to enjoy. Um, and you do have to factor things in like the monetization, the core game loop, um, you know, the, 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 those things have to function and you have to be able to onboard the talent to help you get to that place, because if any of those chains are broken, uh, eventually the game will collapse on itself. So you have to be very contemplative in that exercise. And again, that's where the university comes in. You know, if you can have that local talent, if you can have local talent from which to pick, it's like putting a band together. You know, you need to have access locally to a drummer and a bass player and a guitarist and a lead singer, right? You know, if, if you had to fly around the globe to put that band together, you know, most startup garage bands never would have existed. So somehow there needs to be that local pot of talent from which you can put together the type of team or partnership to try to achieve that escape velocity. And uh, Peter, we're talking about games and thinking about the, 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 uh, the infrastructure. We think about the, the, the game, the IP, Uh, but there's much more around it, right? And also a lot of content uh, being created on YouTube and other forms of entertainment about games. That's also a, a, a part of the industry. Uh, there, are, there were in 2021, I think, 70 million active Free Fire players per day in Brazil. And Brazil also dominated in, in hours watched in streaming, 157 million hours watched on YouTube, uh on streaming uh 
some of the biggest uh, streamers and YouTubers are, are around gaming in several ways, shape, or forms. Again, how do you see this playing out for students, kids, and inspiring people that's in this universe of games? There's other types of business that can, can be created that can be huge around the university of games, but it's not necessarily, uh, you need to be a game developer, you need to have a game studio. Yeah, it's a, it's a great point. If you look at where, let's take a step back, even more macro, if we look at where the entire global media landscape has gone, the number one streaming show in the world this year is The Last of Us on Max, or what used to be HBO Max. Ridiculous to have gotten rid of HBO, by the way. Like, what a great brand. I agree. So kept HBO. <laughs> um, last year, and again, Last of Us based on a game. Last year, the number one streaming show in the world um, on Netflix was The Witcher based on a game. Uh, Super Mario, prior to Barbie this year, was the number one performing film at the box office. Now it's Gran Turismo based on a game. And so that really is where the eye of, of Sauron, if you will, is beginning to train, which is this intersection of gaming, media, and sport. Um, and so when you talk about influencers, um, absolutely there's careers to, to be made and found and created on platforms like Twitch and YouTube. Um, TikTok is becoming a major player um, in gaming. Um, there's going to be room for the snaps and the Twitters as well um, as short form content uh, begins to kind of seep to its own level. Um, so I think like any other form of media that's existed traditionally, film or television or publishing or music, um, there will be those who create the content and the intellectual property, and there will be the apparatus and the ecosystem that grows around it. And there can be phenomenal careers that are very compelling. Um, whether that's in publishing, whether that's in marketing, you know, public relations, distribution, um, customer acquisition, you name it. I mean, there's a, a litany. I mean, we have a, a, a person on my team, a Jen Mannion, whose sole purpose in life is she's the head of talent and she helps hire people for our portfolio companies. That's what she spends her day doing. Um, and these are people um, that can have, in some instances, very obscure jobs that are needed for, you know, a particularly discrete need from one of our portfolio companies. So as the, the market matures, and when you, when you talk about the numbers in Brazil, uh, the free fire consumption, um, you know, the engagement for games like Counter-Strike, um, you know, down in that market, at Fortnite, they're breathtaking numbers. The size of the market is breathtaking. Um, it is why, you know, um, I've been very unabashedly excited about wanting to make sure that a we have really strong partners in market because um, that's important. That you know, one of the lessons I learned early, um, you know, trying to uh, forage my way through markets like Japan and Northern Europe, um, it makes all the difference in the world having smart boots on the ground partners who can help you peel through the layers of of how to get to the best talent. Um, you know, how to have the most efficient and productive conversations um, and where to look for the, the qualitative partnerships that do help achieve that escape velocity for these businesses. But to, to, to put a, a bow on the point, um, you're so right. It is not just about the development of the game. Um, there are layers and layers and layers on top of it, which afford tons of career opportunities to pursue. And uh, coming back to tech, the technology side uh, uh, of it, Peter, there are, uh, I would say, two, two shiny technologies that have been gravitating, orbiting around games, which are Web3 and VR. Uh, how do you see those things playing out in the next five years? Uh, I would say it's not, again, it's not about the present right now, but first getting into the university and then how do I try to plan my career in the next five years and to focus my energy. Uh, and for somehow I have a passion about VR or a passion about uh, Web3. Uh, what would be your uh, opinions and suggestions about this? 
Well, Web3 um, and probably at this point, kind of Web 2.5, if you will, um, is something the industry has wanted and needed for a very long time, which is, you know, I think first and foremost, the removal of friction from the economy. Um, as someone who plays a tremendous and embarrassing amount of Call of Duty, um, to, um, to not have the ability to buy, sell, and trade goods um, is a real missed opportunity for the publisher. Um, and I think at first blush, one could presume, well, but they'll make more by selling more of the goods. You know, they'll make less um, if you're selling them to a third party. Well, at scale, that's not the case. A, they'll take a, a, a small vig, if you will, of the transaction. B, it'll lead to much more engagement. You know, the games that you haven't played for a while, you'll go in and buy, sell, and trade goods. Um, to, to be able to engage that community and create that stickiness of a, of a marketplace. So you are starting to see, as recently as two weeks ago, Zynga made um, a major announcement um, as part now of Take-Two uh, in a partnership with Forte, one of the world's largest infrastructure players, you know, in kind of Web3, um, kind of a soup to nuts solution for, for a publisher. Um, you're starting to see rumblings out of some of the big Asian publishers um, that they're putting this functionality into some of their games offerings. Um, what they're not going to do, uh, which I think is the right approach, uh, what they're not going to do is force consumer behavior patterns because that never works. You have to respond to what the audience wants. Um, that being said, there is a certain cohort, uh, sub-cohort, if you will, that does want to engage in the ability to buy, sell, and trade these goods. It, it does afford you the opportunity um, to uh, become more intimate with the intellectual property, uh, to feel like you have some ownership, some more agency within the offering. So that, that is coming. What is the timeline? You know, I don't know. You're starting to slowly see the big publishers make quiet announcements, though. So there is this cryptic winter, if you will, where, and this is something gaming is very susceptible to, um, and it's something that we spend a lot of time trying to be disciplined around, which is the shiny toy syndrome. Um, so, you know, some of these NFT marketplaces were self-commoditizing races to the bottom. Um, you heard about all these companies in 2021, most of which you're never going to hear about again. Um, they weren't bringing anything proprietary to the market uh, by paying you know, big minimum guarantees to digitize assets and then arbitrage those, you know, therein does not lie a long-term business model because at some point someone gets left holding the bag. But to truly create value, to monetize these things that people are very invested in makes all the sense in the world. You just can't do it at the expense of the gamer who doesn't want to engage at that level. And that's what the publishers and the developers are figuring out right now, but it's incredibly exciting, the long-term prospects of it. As someone who's played a tremendous amount of golf clash on my phone, you know, the amount of clubs and balls that I bought, it'd be great for there to be a marketplace for me to buy, sell, and trade. I've wanted to try other products within the game, but A, I didn't necessarily want to, didn't have the time to matriculate up, you know, enough naturally, or B, perhaps my wife put a limit on the amount of money I was able to spend on mobile gaming that month, whatever it may be, those barriers shouldn't exist. I should have that optionality. And similarly in Call of Duty or Fortnite. And that's where you'll you'll see um, more and more introduction of that functionality. It just won't be dictated. It'll be part and parcel of. And I think the more passive approach is, is appropriate there. You know, VR, um, I'm a huge believer in particular in, in areas outside of gaming right now, if you think about travel and leisure and real estate and telemedicine, um, e-learning, VR is a game changer. Um, and, and I think those industries are going to adapt at scale um, enterprise commercial opportunities with virtual reality and augmented reality. I think gaming has been slower to adapt or adopt rather for a variety of different reasons. I think a virtual reality in its current form factor, it's still somewhat antisocial. You're, you're putting a piece of hardware on your face and you're having somewhat of an isolated experience, even if you're interacting with other people. 
And gaming's gone the exact opposite way. And COVID was a great example of it. Gaming has gotten so very, very social. And, you know, a lot of people with kids, they thank their lucky stars for Roblox and Minecraft and Fortnite because it kept their kids in communication, you know, with their cohort. Um, and that was really important. For me, it was Call of Duty, you know, every single night. You know, we'd play an hour or two of whether it's Call of Duty or Fortnite or Rogue One, whatever it was, we were playing something where we could, uh, it was the virtual version of the water cooler at the office. It was a way to stay in communication uh, with with those that you were accustomed to having that type of casual dialogue with throughout the day. So I think VR has got some things to figure out. The price points are still prohibitive. You know, Apple's new product, when you're talking about hardware in the multiple thousands, people have budgets that they allocate on entertainment um, and they're going to have to judge the return on that investment. You know, gaming is the best return on investment of any media form factor by orders of magnitude. When you look at a, the average AAA game, um, there's somewhere between 140 and 170 hours spent on that title, depending on the genre. You know, compare that 59.99 purchase to taking four people to a movie on a Friday night, which is easily $100 between the tickets and the parking and the food. Um, and so, you know, in bumpier markets where people are looking at budgets, it's no question. You can spend $20 on mobile games and have literally months of content. Um, you can't do that in any other media form factor, really. And so that return on the investment, if you look at the expense of the VR hardware right now and the offering, it's just not there yet. So some other things need to align. As someone who invests in the sector, you know, I operate from the world's largest investment platform looking at, at investing in the gaming ecosystem. No one wants VR and AR to become viable more than me because it expands the TAM. Right. Once the total addressable market grows, my pie grows. So I'm I'm wanting it very badly. And I've seen some unbelievably talented creators, um, mutual friends of ours, for example, here in Los Angeles. Uh, I don't know if you want to name the company. Um, uh, I'll I'll let you do that. Um, but you know, there's some unbelievable talent that's that's working in the sector. Um, and so you can't wait for for both of kind of XR and AR to achieve that escape velocity. Sure, I I I'm I'm a big believer, uh, but I, I agree with your your point about the return on investment. We are for gaming, we are still not there yet. And, and what about AI? How, how do you think it will impact uh, games at uh, more scripted games? or actually asset generation, which is something really tough. Uh, uh, what do you think are the opportunities for AI in the gaming sector? Specifically it's, on, the, on it, game develop, game studio, not like gaming content, media, etc., but actually creating new IPs, creating new games. I think AI is going to touch a, a ton of areas within gaming. You know, we, the first investment we made, it, made into AI... Um, It's called Model AI, um, helped address the wants and needs to eliminate the friction in QA. QA has just been an antiquated part of gaming. It really hasn't been innovated for 25 years. So it's such a natural place for, for AI to have that objectivity um, is, is mission critical there. Um, asset development, it's already happening. Um, some of the numbers are gobsmacking that we're seeing just in terms of how involved AI will be um, in the next three to five years. So we're talking almost overnight, the impact that that AI will have. Um, that being said, um, we, we think um, some of the things that we're currently contemplating with respect to AI are exciting. It's the things we're not even currently thinking about uh, where AI is gonna play just a, a massive role. Um, you know, very exciting. True storytellers are always going to be needed. Um, you know, the creative direction of a product, um, how to innovate on top of an existing product. There's going to always be that want and need, you know, for the, the human element. Um, but AI is going to have a massive, massive impact on gaming. Optimization for marketing, you know, understanding, being able to parse through 
where to be more efficient with the deployment of your marketing dollar. Um, AI is already uh, being used in areas such as this. You, you're going to have to remove the human element in some of those instances, or at least aid and abet what the humans are doing there. Um, so to more efficiently parse through that data can really help achieve that escape velocity for a game that perhaps thought it had plateaued, um, but perhaps they were just deploying their marketing dollars in the wrong places. Um, and AI could be very, very helpful there. So there, there really isn't an area of gaming uh, that one could contemplate in the current state um, where AI couldn't play uh, a meaningful role. So we couldn't be more excited about it. From an underwriting orientation, we've seen very few companies thus far you know, that are underwritable. Um, a lot of what we're seeing is off the shelf, kind of stitched together product. Um, we're still waiting to understand what the bigs are going to do. What are the Unity's going to do and the Google's going to do and the Microsoft's going to do and the Samsung's going to do? Um, I mean, there's, you know, 15 companies out there um, who we're all watching very closely and want to better understand their orientation towards the sector because they will be the first through the wall and they'll be the first through the wall with significant budgets. So um, it'll be interesting to see as they invest in the form of market growth versus ROI, um, we're going to see a lot of creative stuff in the next few years, it's gonna be a ton of fun. And for us to be able to bring a lot of that, <clears throat> those products to our portfolio companies and let them A-B test product um, and see, you know, kind of what's working for their particular game, that particular genre, perhaps orientated initially towards a, a particular geography. Um, we're, uh, we're very anxious to, to, to continue to um, have our our team trained on looking for the best talent and what are the most functional products out there kind of that will be of utility to our portfolio companies. Amazing. No, and, and as we're talking, uh, I met recently a uh, uh, team super hardcore AI, so not just like encapsulating chat GPT. And, and I just thought about use, yeah, I use case in gaming, what they're building. So we'll talk about this later. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, like real, you know, real time company, thinking about it. Any company you find interesting, I want to talk to. So I, I have the utmost respect for your filter. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. We'll talk about this. Uh, okay. And uh, we are almost wrapping up. So in Brazil, uh, VCs are, are still very light in uh, early stage investments in, in gaming. We invest in, in wildlife, uh, but we are starting to see, I think uh, the stars are aligning, right? So you have the former uh, wildlife employees gang, they are building things and they're like, they, uh, these people are, everybody wants to talk to them. Uh, we had a success of Aquiris, also recently that show, yes, we can do this here and it can be huge both for investors and the, and the founders. Some funds are starting to, to invest in those teams. You, you have the university in Spain, more attention to this. Book has an amazing team around uh, gaming as uh, I, I always like to say, the Lua programming language around Roblox was created at uh, Puki Hill and it's still a very relevant, and I, I would say more and more relevant uh, language for, for the gaming uh, community. Uh, I think a curiosity, uh, uh, one of the creators of ID Soft software, he said that uh, Lua is the, the language that he likes the most. Uh, I think John Romero. Uh, so it's also super interesting. And so I, I believe the stars are starting to align. So, so we we get our Finland moment here. Is there something that you believe is still missing that we need to pay very attention so we're, we're not get over anxious and then we get a disappointment. Oh, it didn't happen. And you see when you have those disappointments, things take a lot more than they should to, to recover. Uh, do you think there's something that needs to be pay a lot of attention so we don't have uh, be disappointed? <clears throat> I would say from my time, both in, in Sao Paulo and, and, and Rio, um, 
there's all the elements for success down there. Um, again, consumption patterns, demographics, um, but probably most importantly, um, you know, and a bit more kind of esoterically is, is the passion and enthusiasm that you get from, I mean, I had a ton of meetings when I was down there that were scheduled to be an hour and they ended up being two hours because we were just all talking about our favorite games and, you know, people are pulling up, you know, pictures of screen grabs of high scores and characters they've built. And you, you know, when that starts to happen and, and some of these were in financial settings, um, that you know there, there's some really compelling tailwinds down in in brazil um so no I, I i don't think missteps along the way um you know the industry is uh is is rife with that you can look in the rearview mirror of the roadkill in any market that has emerged um there there were some anomalous markets like finland like turkey like israel where for a variety of different reasons these smaller markets even korea just punch way above their weight in gaming. Um, and that happens in other industries too, by the way. It just so happens that, you know, for certain reasons, certain micro markets are incredibly efficient. Um, and there's no reason why, you know, Brazil uh, can't put itself on the map in a more meaningful way. You know, wildlife, I, I mean, 80% of the people I met with down there somehow were investors in wildlife. Um, or they had some role to play, and and there's a lot of pride in what that company has been able to do. There's no reason why in three to five years we shouldn't have thirty stories of either success or um, companies that are on that trajectory to a scaled success. Um, what what begins to happen, and we see it now with Riot and Activision and Blizzard, the ecosystem in Los Angeles is absolutely outstanding. And it is a thousand percent replaced the energy that used to be up in San Francisco. It just has. That's very much due to the fact that because of the success of Riot and Blizzard and Activision and you know Sony and its its proximity in Orange County and San Diego, after seven eight years, people get the itch and they leave, and then they start their own studio, um, and then they spin out. So if you look at you know Respawn um, selling to Electronic Arts, and if you look at all the developers behind Call of Duty, you know, a bunch of which are based here in Los Angeles. After X amount of years, inevitably, the talent want to start. They want to take their own shot on goal. So that has spawned this incredible ecosystem right here in Los Angeles. Same thing in Seattle. You know, you have Microsoft, you have Nintendo up there for a while with their campus. You have Valve. Um, and that's why we see, you know, these markets start to gel. Um, and it's everything from the teeny tiny startup you know, a few kids in a garage coming up with an idea to more scaled apparatus. Um, we're going to see that happen in Brazil. I'm, I'm hell bent on, on being part of, uh, of that growth. I felt it. It was palpable to me and Ibrahim when we were down there. Um, and people were just really excited that, you know, folks like us with our platform are coming down there, spending the cycles, looking at underwriting opportunities. I probably had 25 follow-up meetings since, um, you know, with folks from Brazil, uh, just around this exact topic, like how do we move the, the ball forward? What can we do to put more foundational blocks in place? And part of it for me is being boots on the ground is why I plan to come down more next year with you, you know, and, and spend more time with folks and find um, practical, efficient ways with which to help put those foundational blocks in place. Brilliant. Let's do this. And my, my last question would be, suppose I'm a, a, a professor at, at, at PUC Hill, and let's do some case studies. Uh, which companies in your portfolio could be a good inspiration uh, for so some, some case studies for students to see, hmm, I, I can become an entrepreneur around this subject, this other one, uh, and studying them would, would inspire me? Well, Dis Discord for sure, because Discord started out as a developer. And they pivoted dramatically to become, you know, the number one communication platform in the world for gaming. So that's a great company to dissect and understand. You talk about parking your ego at the door and not necessarily being religious about where you're going with your company. Like, it's a great story. I think Overwolf, too, um, the world's leading modding business, phenomenal story, unbelievable entrepreneur, um, 
great m a very very contemplative calculated m a over the last decade um took what was considered the largest component of indie gaming and codified it as an institutional part of the gaming ecosystem now i think those would be great companies to look at brilliant brilliant peter well thank you so much for for your time and attention uh helping uh us at Puki Rio to understand more this this sector and to, to inspire the, the kids about this you said at this huge opportunities this huge sector where there's lots of opportunities not only uh, hardcore coding and uh let's keep in touch and do brilliant things together there and here also in Brazil Oh, I look forward to it. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Peter. Have a nice day. Take care.